Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me today is Tho Bishop, my co-host here at Radio Rothbard. And we're going to talk today about political parties and political realignment. This seems to be an issue of, um, I don't know, it's, uh, some interest, given that RFK Jr. has been talking about it, uh, specifically in an interview with Tucker Carlson. And also there's, I've just been seeing mentions about the topic. And what we mean by this is the, the, the different groups that make up political parties are shifting and uh, who's who's going to be in the Democratic Party? Who's going to be in the Republican Party going forward? And are we seeing real changes there? Uh, first, though, I just want to make sure and mention and make sure you know about our current free book giveaway. And we're giving away how to think about the economy. This is a short book. It's really in the tradition of economics in one lesson. It's by our fellow Pear Beeland. And you can get yourself a free copy. This book's a short easily read book and uh, just go to mises.org slash rothpod free for your free copy that's m-i-s-e-s dot o-r-g slash rothpod free and you can get your 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 free copy of how to think about the economy it gives you just some real basics uh, of how to think uh, from an Austrian school perspective real good stuff uh, highly recommend this book so, though, the reason this came up is I kept seeing all these posts about RFK Jr. and also Tulsi Gabbard endorsing Donald Trump. And, of course, both of these people, Gabbard and Kennedy, were Democrats uh, not too long ago. And true, they weren't typical Democrats, but they were definitely Democrats. I mean, they were closely associated with the party. They went to the Democrat Party events. They did fundraising for the party. Tulsi Gabbard was a member of the party and had she run again, would have been reelected more than likely. So it's, it's not like they were kicked out of the party until they actively started campaigning really against Joe Biden. And for obvious reasons, because maybe they wanted a candidate who wasn't just awful like Biden. But I think they also saw that there were some shifts in the Democratic Party and what it stood for and and who was in it. And they have used the term political realignment. And what does that mean? Uh, this is this term's been around a long, long time. And in the, the current meaning, what it really means is what is the coalition of different groups that makes up political party X? And when those those different groups change and move from one party to another, you have what's known as a political realignment. Now, if you're my age, you're in your mid forties, then you know the term because it dates back in terms of for my generation, back to the mid 1990s. The last time we saw an obvious political realignment was in 1994 when suddenly there was a massive change in what parties controlled the Congress. And this was due to a realignment uh, from Southern, uh, in terms of Southern whites moving from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. And this was a big deal at the time in the political science literature and it was all over the media because uh, up until that time, you were a Southern white person, especially you were probably a Democrat. And so you can imagine just how different the Democratic Party <laughs> was back then uh, compared to now that this seemed like a reasonable home for a lot of uh, Southern Christian white people who thought, yeah, Democratic Party seems like a reasonable place to be. And you could just see that in the fact that they this is the party that nominated Jimmy Carter, a practicing Christian man of uh, right, fairly traditional moral background. And how did this guy end up being the party nominee for the Democrats uh, so long ago? It was because the party was very, very different and the political alignment was, was different at the time. And so I think we can just explore a little bit this issue and, and speculate about, okay, is that going on right now? And uh, is there any meaningful change in what the political realignment is between these two parties. And so I guess my question, just to kick it off for you, though, is do you think uh, Kennedy is right? Is there a new phase of political realignment taking, taking place? 
And well, okay, if so, who's moving where and what's significantly different from say 10 years ago? Well, one thing I think it's important to just note is that these political realignments do not happen overnight. So again, I live in the Florida panhandle. I mean, you had people still running as Democrats winning office into the 2000s. Uh, we had a Democrat congressman representing our area until uh, 2010 um, with kind of the Tea Party revolution. Um, There's a lot of Obamacare backlash. Then we, got, we had a county commissioner who again, changed parties, became a Republican um, that was elected in, 20, in 2000, who ended up being a state senator. So like, these processes, and, and this was a decades long process within the South that turned it from kind of that blue dog populist Democrat sort of era to the you know, particularly, the, you know, everything kind of came together during the Bush years, first and foremost, as, as well as it, it, there's also some interesting races smearing uh, uh, war veterans in southern areas for, for not being uh, patriotic enough because they oppose Bush's wars and things like that. And so this process can take a long period of time. And to me, the way that I view this past week in particular with RFK coming over, with Tulsi coming over, is that in many ways it is a demonstration that the revolution of 2016 Trump's takeover of the GOP, um, kind of the the highlighting of, of the Democrat Party as really the, the true party of the regime as it stands, right? The, the All the worst aspects of the regime kind of consolidated behind um, a very progressive cultural agenda and the like, that this process is continuing to take place. And I think a big aspect of this comes to how we consume media content. Because again, historically, right, you know, both sides were kind of getting both a vision of who they oppose, but also what they stand for, because you had kind of very tightly aligned silos for forming opinion, right? For the intellectuals, there was magazines on both sides, right? National View being the most obvious sort of example on the right. You had Fox News for the base. You had maybe some Rush Limbaugh for a little bit of, of more alternative content out there. But so they would tell you how to, you know, how bad the Democrats were, but then also who the good guys were. And so both camps kind of stayed, you know, there, there was a lot of, you know, it, 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 unless you were a curious person reading outside of the mainstream outlets, if, if you're reading, you know, LouRockwell.com or American Conservative on the right, other blogs on the left, right, for the most part, voters were kind of drinking from the same trough when it came to content. Of course, now we're in a world of, of, I think cultural tri I think content tribalism is is kind of the, the better way of understanding this this alternative media outlet where you know you, you think about the audience for Joe Rogan, you think about the audience to a certain extent of what Tucker Carlson has created. On the left, you might think of, you know, you know, Pod Save America or kind of, kind of the dirt bag left shows out there who are very closely aligned with like uh, Bernie Sanders campaign and sort of democratic socialists, you know, Rachel Maddow, both on TV and, and her various podcasts, right? You you know that those listeners really, really hate Trump. Very, very much so. They hate everything that, that Trump America stands for, right? But in terms of actual ideologies, they might go in a various different ways. On the right, again, your average Joe Rogan listener, you have a, probably a feeling that they are not a Kamala fan. But, you know, are they a Trump fan? Are they a RFK fan? Are they a, you know, libertarian fan? Maybe not capital L, you know, Chase Oliver sort of guy, right? But maybe a Dave Smith person, right? You, you, you know, what they actually believe is kind of a, a hodgepodge there, but kind of knew what they were against. And I think this kind of just is a demonstration of these, this larger underlying aspect of where the base are, where, where voters are, where average Americans are, now actually starting to, to take form in political coalitions. And I think Trump is a very unique figure here because Trump is probably the only Republican that you could imagine actually giving someone like RFK or Tulsi Gabbard a seat at the table when it comes to the transition team. That's kind of the first step. We'll see how that translates into actual, you know, who is hired to various positions. Obviously, when it comes to people like RFK, like Tulsi, there are things that they stand for that we can be excited about, right? You know, there's there's a lot of people within Mises Institute orbits that we've met in events, right? They, they were very much interested in RFK because of his medical freedom positions. Tulsi has had her support within libertarian circles for criticisms of aspects of the war on terror, though she is by no means a dove, right? The other side of it, though, is that, you know, they are perhaps uniquely bad on issues that, that you know, Republicans, quote unquote, kind of generic Republican, probably less so of. Uh, RFK, you might think of environmental policy. Um, 
Tulsi is kind of an, just an interesting bag in her own right because her kind of her pre-existing views before she became a Democratic representative were, were very different, right? And so, like, you know, that's that's kind of an open question in itself. And so, but this kind of is reflecting kind of concerns within the Republican Party generally. You know, they're having union bosses speak at the RNC, larger conversations about tariffs. And so this this change, right? It's not as simple as saying, okay, well, the Republican Party is becoming, you know, the anti-war party and therefore it's becoming better. There are, you know, perhaps some some new differences in terms of kind of problematic areas from your know, traditional Republican orth- orthodoxy to the extent that Republicans ever really cared about these economic issues and the like, right? You know, but it I think it, it does reflect a growing sense of, you know, to me, dealing with average Republican voters, right? Kind of the the the, the, the Trump crowd, the the war room, Steve Bannon crowd, you know, what re- listening to them religiously. What unites all these people is skepticism, if not outright hatred of the regime, right? It is skepticism or hatred of the FBI, of the intelligence agencies. It is kind of a growing sense of awareness that the government has repeatedly lied to them. It's concerns about how the election was was done. It's concerns about kind of this axis of corporate power and deep state power, right? And so there is kind of this, I think, this growing sense that the base has of very, you know, I think very positive from our perspective, this this growing cynicism of Washington itself. And so when you hear RFK talk about how he is joining the Trump campaign because of the, the lawsuits that the Democrats ran against him to keep him off the ballot, when it's it, it goes to various aspects of, again, the indictment there is corruption of the Democratic Party, the corruption of the deep state, uh, suppressing free speech, kind of these, these fairly you know, traditional liberal views that Dem- that RFK has identified as the Democrat Party now representing the other side of, with Tulsi, similar things, right? You know, she, um, you know, she has been put on a terror watch list, and she, you know, faults the the Biden Harris administration as kind of a blowback retaliatory measure there, right? So in some ways, Democrats have created these enemies by the way that they have treated these alternative voices within their party, and and of course, the fact that this is all happening under the Trump campaign does not mean that the rank and file of the Republican political apparatus, you know, when it comes to the members of Congress or the makeup of the Senate, right, you know, those those bodies are always kind of last groups of power that are changed by this realignment. But I, I think that these recent endorsements, this kind of creation of this you know, unity, whatever they're calling it, coalition um, that is behind Trump this time around, it is a continuation of what happened in 2016. It is a reflection of where the base is moving. And it will be interesting to see that the real question mark is for one, you know, how does it play out in November? And then if it plays out, you know, if, if Trump does win in November, what is the fallout in the future when it comes to actually changing the makeup and the ideology of the legislature and some of these other governing aspects of the party. But again, I think from our perspective, again, for all the complaints, all the concerns we might have about RFK or Tulsi, I'd much rather have an RFK or a Tulsi over a Chris Christie and over a Mike Pence, over the sort of traditional Republican guard that made up the transition teams of the Trump administration that filled up the, the Trump administration in terms of secretary positions and the like. And so again, I, I think there's some reasons that we can you know see this as a as a, a an improvement over the political status quo, even if there's no reason to, you know, there, there's no way that these people are, are libertarian per se and some sort of uh, actual ideological vision for the country. Yeah, I think if you are going to pursue the idea that your political party should be ideologically pure or present some sort of consistent ideological vision, you're going to be extremely disappointed because political parties have never functioned that way. Uh, right, as you just described, this this new sort of political coalition we're looking at among Republicans, what's it's what's it based on? Well, it's based on we kind of hate these groups. That that does not that is not a consistent ideological view. <laughs> that that's a group that we've hammered together based on opposition to a certain thing. But that sort of thing can fit all sorts of different people in it who have a common enemy and who may not have some sort of consistent ideological cohesion otherwise. And that's how political parties have always been. A a lot of times, I remember you could just ask the question, how is it that group X and group Y could be together in the same political party? You used to say, hear this a little bit in the, say, the 90s, 
when it became clear that the Democratic Party was the party of extreme environmentalism, and it was also the party of union labor. Well, those two groups, they have no reason to be together, and yet they were together in the Democratic Party. Why? Well, it was for some non-ideological reason. It was because the coalition had been built based on political favors and the fact that, okay, I'm union labor, so I know I can get certain favors if the Democratic Party wins. And the environmentalists said the same thing to themselves, even though they really had no reason ideologically to be united to each other. And we can find this historically as well all the time. Look at the 19th century Democratic Party. Why would the Locofocos of New York, who tended to be abolitionist, they were very, very free market. They also tended to be pro-industry. They were, they were populist in terms of let everybody vote. This was based in New York and New Jersey. Very laissez-faire, extremely laissez-faire. Uh, this was the William Leggett branch of the Democratic Party. How on earth were these people in the same party with the slave owners of the, the cotton belt? Well, they were. There were certain conflicts that arose from that, but there was, but they also managed to work together well enough to put together majorities in Congress in many cases. Now, Rothbard points out in his Volcker Fund memos that eventually the, the fanaticism in favor of slavery became so bad by the 1850s that it ended up splitting the party, whereas slavery had been kind of the secondary issue in, in the 20s and 30s. By the 50s, the fire eaters, the pro-slavery fire eaters had become so obsessed with the issue that it ended up alienating the anti-slavery Democrats, and they split off uh, to free soil parties and things like that. And that ended up destroying the Democratic Party enough that Lincoln wins in 1860. So it does, you do get to a point where the ideological differences can get so extreme that the party can no longer hold together. But you can see how for decades, people who have no reason to be together, these abolitionists in New Jersey and these slave owners in Alabama, they have no reason to be together ideologically. Yet they put together this coalition and it can endure for a long, long time. So we see that all the time in political parties because there is no real ideological cohesion. Now you're, you're taught this in your like freshman level classes if you're like a poli sci major or whatever, right? Is that political parties, they're not ideological groups. They're vessels into which you pour different ideological groups that somehow mix together and create these coalitions that get people elected. The purpose of a political party almost by definition, is it, it, it's an organization designed to elect people to political office. Now, you can take other views of a political party, like the Libertarian Party does, where we're an educational group and we're trying to, we're trying to teach people about libertarianism. Okay, that's fine. I, I mean, maybe, maybe the, the party accomplishes that. But that's also why the Libertarian Party never wins any elections, is because they're, they're devoted to this ideological view and pushing a certain ideological view. Well, that's not... That's not how a political party is effective and how it wins and how it runs successful candidates. Political parties simply aren't constructed in a way to push an ideology. Ideology is uphill from political parties, right? Is your ideology is formed through media, it's formed through your parents, it's formed through your schooling. And then now you've got all these groups out there with different ideologies and political parties. The challenge of political parties is to find different groups with different ideologies and assemble them in a certain way that you can now run successful candidates. So your political parties reflect the ideologies out there. They don't form the ideologies out there. And that's also, of course, now the reason why you don't have either party taking any sort of hardline laissez-faire position, and you don't have any sort of real pro-peace party. Now, I saw that Ron Paul asked this question in his column from Monday, is will there actually be a peace party in 2024, where it could be that a party composed of Kennedy, Gabbard, and Trump could be certainly the most peace party in a long time, depending on how bad Trump is on things like Iran and China. Uh, I'm still, I'm still a long way from being convinced that even the good guys in terms of foreign policy will be good on China. Nevertheless, clearly, if you want to keep the U.S. out of war, the Democratic Party is worse. Uh, but that, that's just based on these are the ideologies of the groups that have kind of ended up in these parties. It's not because the party has some sort of cohesive ideology here. Uh, if you want to change the ideology of the parties, you need to change the ideologies of the population. And that's why groups like the Mises Institute exist is we're upstream from political parties and 
it's it's then what people believe that determines what political party platforms are and what people believe in these coalitions. And that's just a different thing. You're not going to change the ideology of the country by telling political parties to change what they're doing and what sort of candidates they're running because political parties want to run candidates who win. And if nobody in the general population believes in laissez-faire or in peace, neither party is going to run anybody who believes that. So that's what the real core problem of ideology is that the ideological challenge is changing ideologies outside the party first. Right. I mean, the closest thing to an ideology of kind of the, the, what is growing as this Trump coalition is, do you have a political opinion that would have been flagged as misinformation on Facebook two years ago? And if the answer is yes, then chances are you're probably open to voting for Trump. If you have never held a political opinion that be flagged by social media as being misinformation, then you're probably in lockstep with the Kamala campaign and, and posting brat memes, right? And and so, I mean, and I, I think it's a very helpful tool and kind of just showing where, again, this, this anti-regime sort of aspect is as at the core. And again, like this is not a cohesive worldview here. And what I think is most fascinating about this is that it's not simply about the base. It's not simply about some of these, these personality figures of like an RFK or a Tulsi or Trump or things like that. Um, what, what I think is just as interesting is the... Uh, you know, what, what we might call kind of a kind of a counter elite that is rising up that is actively talking about Donald Trump. You see a lot of it from kind of old school Silicon Valley folks, you know, Elon Musk, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy was kind of part of that camp. Peter Thiel has kind of been part of that camp in the past, right? These sort of people that have had um, libertarian ish instincts in terms of being upset about the, the role that regulation has played in preventing um, the development of their particular industries and the like. Again, I'm not trying to say any of these people are libertarian, but libertarian instincts and in terms of frustration of dealing with Washington and the like. You and, and this is why, you know, again, Trump being a very transactional politician, I think one of the most fascinating stories in modern American politics has been the political maturation of the crypto industry in particular, because, you know, this is something that, you know, has been created Again, as backlash, again, this is this, you know, forms of political backlash are, are, are really kind of all aligning here, is that it's the extent to which the Biden administration really went to war, escalated the war on crypto with Gary Gensler as, as uh, SEC chairman, uh, attempts to debank the industry. They're um, you know, preventing people like Caitlin Long, who's been trying to create a crypto bank in Wyoming from being able to have access to the Federal Reserve's master accounts, things like that. Um, you know, the, the prosecution of, of Ross Albrecht, which is a pre-Biden move, but obviously the, the question of, of him being released out of jail has come up now in the political campaign. And so what you have there is that you have a, a very specific industry that has a very clear interest, right? Their interest is their bank account. Um, on top of whatever ideological views they might have about the role of Bitcoin in society. And I, I don't want to dismiss those, but ultimately, you know, the, the big win here, like what, what Trump is basically offering, which is the same kind of offer they, you know, is, is you, know, you vote for me and I will make you richer. You've got a specific industry interest. My, I, I am aligned with your interest, even though he was against the interest when he was president. But like he is, he is, you know, his, his opportunism here, he represents a political opportunity. And therefore now you have an entire, you, you have an, you have an, you have an industry, a new industry, an industry that thankfully um, has very much been developed within a libertarian framework of the state, right? If you're interested in Bitcoin, if you're interested in crypto, that starts off with a understanding of, of, a, of a desiring of an alternative form of currency away from complete state control, right? So we are very lucky that here you have a growing industry that that, that was fermented in kind of cyber libertarian forms. It has a libertarian ethos that has been able to mature and, and has the financial capabilities of you know, attracting political people willing to apply that in politics. And, and the result of that is, again, any policy, again, if Trump wins, if Republicans win, if you have that leverage that, that industry now has, the opportunity there is that people that hold crypto will be made richer as a result of the policies there, since people that hold crypto are going to be disproportionately more libertarian than not. And that's going to be good for the entire ideological system in terms of how they you know, do, do they invest in libertarian causes outside of politics? Do they invest in more libertarian politicians and the like? Right. And so, again, this is another area where, again, this is kind of very vulgar, uh, you know, kind of a vulgar form of politics. Right. You know, kind of a, a patronage style of politics, which arguably is all politics really is at the end of the day, um, where there is an opportunity here for, again, something that is really ground and grounded in this idea of being against the regime, against traditional established powers, uh, these other forms of elite that have been bucking against aspects that the regime has, has 
levied that have, have frustrated their entrepreneurial ideals. And all of these, again, there, there's there's plenty of differences when it comes to, to social views, right, cultural views, um, you know, where these people live in the country and the like, different views on foreign policy. But they're all aligned by the idea that the state as it currently exists is not working to their own benefit. And sometimes their own interests align with kind of our broader vision of, you know, of, of, of creating more liberty for people. So that's that's what makes this a very interesting moment to be be watching politics. And again, this is as again Rothbard's work on the changing of political systems, the you know the 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 analysis in the past. And again, a lot of culture, a lot of liberal revolutions, political liberal revolutions, typically have been backed by you know middle class merchant sort of classes that were bucking against. Uh, different forms of of privilege given to state aligned authorities and the like, right? So there's there's the, through the history of political liberalism, there's always been this economic aspect that has driven these political changes. This has always been an aspect of these political revolutions. And again, we can I think we can identify that with the current era, which makes it interesting to analyze, regardless of what one's individual opinion is on Trump or voting or politics generally. This is definitely something that is worth understanding and appreciating for what it, what it has the possibility to mean in our contemporary political order. And I think if you're going to do coalition building, you have to do two things, right? As you just talked about, you need to bring in new people who, for whatever reason, are, are seeing your side as the side that can give them a voice of some kind or maybe provide some sort of self-defense against whatever horrible thing the regime is doing. Uh, or just all your friends are now switching, so you're going to do that too. But th- but then you also have to not alienate the the groups that are already in your coalition as best as possible, uh, because of course if you lose a bunch of people, bringing in new people doesn't help you that much. And you can see how Trump's pretty good at this, right? Trump has all, steadfastly uh, refused to criticize anything like Social Security or Medicare or anything like that. If anything, he's doubled down on spending more on that. So Trump knows how the game is played. He knows you you got to buy votes from the old folks. So he's making sure that he's not alienating any of the old folks. He's buying their votes by making sure, yeah, we'll give you more Medicare. We'll give you more Social Security. And this, by the way, illustrates how ideology comes from outside the parties, right? Is that people... Uh, our people have been so totally brainwashed into the idea that they're owed Medicare and Social Security by the regime that is, quote unquote, their money, all factually disprovable, all demonstrably false nonsense. But people have been convinced of this, that they're just getting their money back when in reality they're just stealing money from current wage earners. Uh, but they're, they're just believe this because they've been fed this spoon fed this idea for decades. And so to try, and so that just shows that the, if you want to win, you have to just reflect the ideology of the people in the population. That's how a political party is going to win. They can't just, they can't lecture people about ideology and we'll get to the Dems on that, uh, in a second. So he's just like, no, of course I'm not going to cut any Social Security or Medicare. I'm just going to keep shoveling you that money because you believe you deserve it. So that's that's something you have to do as a political party leader as well. Well, and, and where Trump has had the most tension with kind of traditional Republican voters have has been on recent statements that he's made on the question of abortion. You know, he had the tweet uh, last week about, um, you know, his administration will be great for you know, reproductive freedom. Um, which, you know, whether that means, you know, liberalizing on abortion views, whether that means protecting IVF, you know, a variety of things, you know, that you, it's, you can interpret that in a variety of ways. But he has gotten backlash from you know, uh, evangelical leaders. He's gotten backlash from um, kind of national pro-life groups now, you know, in, and that has created a source of tension. But of course, you know, from the from the Trump side of things, right, you know, delivering the Dobbs decision, which got rid of Roe v. Wade. Um, you know, which is the biggest victory for the pro-life movement of, of all time, right? You know, there, there's, there's, you know, I, I understand the, the view there. It's like, I mean, what, what more do you want us to give you? Like these, these, this, these are issues that we've seen, um, you know, f- fail uh, when it comes to to state elections and the like. Right? So it's kind of been a backlash there. There's, there's, I think there's a larger dynamic there in, in which kind of national interest groups never actually prepare for victory. Right. It's kind of the same dynamic where, you know, as Rothbard talked about the extent to which, uh, you know, all these Cold War institutions existed, but no one actually you know, considered what would happen if the Soviet Union actually fell. Um, so luckily, the Mises Institute was, was able to jump in there and actually give economic advice for how do you de-socialize an economy there. So you have all these national organizations that were running on anti-abortion, anti-abortion, anti-abortion. And then, you know, then, then they get it and they have no real sort of state organization to win the battles afterwards. And now they're upset that some of the language is is moderating 
um, when it's become a, a when it's perceived as a political liability. And I guess that's, that's has nothing to do with with the moral views on abortion. It's you know abominable, et cetera, et cetera. But again, from a political calculation, from you know, taking away the moral views and kind of looking at a political calculation, that is one source of tension um, that is popping up. It'll be interesting to see how much that actually translates to average voters. I think most people who consider themselves pro-life recognize that the, the cultural dynamics between you know, Trump and you know, the Democratic Party writ large couldn't be more clear kind of on those on those views. I mean, you know, when you have abortion trucks and vasectomy vans, you know, outside of the Democratic head, headquarters, you kind of see exactly how much they worship um, this sort of stuff rather than just kind of, you know, moderate political rhetoric coming from Trump's truth account and the like. Right. But that is one area where kind of that, that Trump is seeing a little bit of tension from that traditional Republican base. It'll be interesting to see how, again, how that dynamic continues uh, going forward. And again, it's kind of also reflected in pla- platform battles that went on in the RNC and things like that. So that's one battlefield. That's one kind of aspect to where this changing of this Trump coalition um, has created a little bit of tension with kind of traditional Republican voters on top of any other personality aspects that has created tension between Trump and traditional Republican voters politicians, most of which are cowards, which are not going to voice in public their own personal concerns and criticisms of Trump himself. Well, that brings us to the issue, too, of the Democratic Party alienating people in their coalition, right? Is, as you say, Trump is the moderate on this issue of abortion. There's no reason why abortion should be a federal law issue at all. Well, we need a federal law on every sort of crime imaginable. Uh, Hi, murder is already illegal in every state and county. Uh, we don't need any federal laws on it. And if you want abortion to be illegal, make it illegal in the exact same place where all other types of murder are illegal, and in state legislatures and in county ordinances. That's where we deal with that sort of thing. There doesn't need to be federal law on this. In fact, if the Republicans were smart, they would uh, draw up a, a constitutional amendment tomorrow that said, uh, Congress shall make no law regarding the issue of abortion whatsoever. And so that there would be no laws either making it illegal, none of this arresting people for praying outside abortion clinics, nonsense, but also no federal laws banning it. Because, of course, there's no reason why it can't be banned at the state level. And that's, that's of course, by the way, the Constitution was designed to function. Uh, but I guess the rule of law is just right out the window when you're obsessed with the issue and everything needs to be a federal issue, I suppose. But what's interesting is that the Dems have d- doubled down so much on this issue that they, they put a giant sculpture of an IUD out in front of the, the convention, if I remember correctly. Uh, I mean, that's just this is like mental illness. That's just so weird. And that has alienated people within the party. When you think about, you just have people who are like willing to just tolerate abortion, right? It's just not something to think about all day. And I think about all of these Christian Hispanics who write, oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm against abortion, they would say. But, right, it's just not a big deal. I don't hear about it that much from the party. Now, that would have been true 25 years ago. But now, I mean, when you, you're just being lectured constantly by party leaders about how wonderful abortion is, is the most important thing in the universe, that does tend to alienate people after a while. Now, I, I'm Hispanic enough and have been around enough Hispanics to know these people are not all like devout Christians or something like that, right? But at the same time, when you're constantly being told that killing babies is just absolutely like uh, the most, <laughs> the most amazing, wonderful thing in human history, which is what you hear basically from the Democratic Party right now, that tends to kind of stick in your craw after a while when you like babies. So that seems to be at work here, uh, especially in say Southern Texas and a lot of these other places where you just have more moderate, Hispanic, normal working class people who unlike ruling class whites who are obsessed with the issue is like their defining issue that doesn't pull them into the party. And so they start to see actually when they see Trump say, yeah, I don't really care about the issue. Uh, I'm going to leave it up to others. That seems like the moderate position. That seems like the more tolerable position. So you could see how that would drive some political alignment in that case. And just this has been a much longer issue, too, is how the Democratic Party used to be the Catholic Party. It used to be the Catholic Immigrant Party. It used to be that's where you went. Um, if you were a Catholic, you did not join the Republican Party, which was kind of more this WASP party that was certainly opposed to your grandparents who emigrated from Italy or maybe Mexico. And you didn't want to be any part of that party, especially since I remember in the 90s, Republicans constantly badmouthing Mexicans, including Mexicans who were small business owners and taxpayers and all of that, just for whatever reason. I don't know why. I'm like, maybe you should stop alienating these people. Uh, but it seems Trump, weirdly, has actually managed to really attract 
attract a lot of these people to the party. And the Democrats have done their part in pushing those people out of their party. And so I do think you see some real realignment there, especially outside California, where I think Hispanics who are outside California are much more prone to this sort of realignment toward the Republicans. Yeah, nothing I think better represents kind of the decay or the, the bizarre world of American political politics where we have gone from kissing babies as the form of political pandering to killing babies as the form of political pandering at the, at the DNC. Um, but this is the world we live in. Um, but, but you're right. And we're seeing those sort of demographics, which uh, uh, we've seen a, a massive trend with Hispanic voters in particular, I think largely driven by a lot of these cultural issues. Uh, and the like. And, and of course, in many ways, you know, Kamala's campaign right now, I mean, kind of similar to Biden's campaign in 2020, is the perfect personification of what the modern Democratic Party is to the extent that it stands for nothing besides hating Trump and hating, hating red America and kind of making fun of people that would dare to vote for Donald Trump. Um, and this is, you know, I mean, Biden was campaigning from a basement. Kamala's campaign is largely made up of an edge of sketch board where you kind of shake and everything that stands in the past has disappeared. And, you know, th this idea, I mean, you know, what we're seeing kind of really play out is the idea of a media run state, a media run political party, where, again, I, I think Kamala's finally going to do an interview with with Tim Walls. Right. So it won't be a one, -on one interview because, you know, she kind of struggles speaking on her own. Um, you know, but this is someone who entered the race under bizarre circumstances, did not have any sort of public one-on-one uh, you know, -on -one interview for you know over a month of her campaign, um, and someone whose entire sort of yeah you know, every policy proposals that she has provided at this point either reflect reversing of previous views that she ran on in that far distant future of 2020, or far distant past sorry of of 2020, or um, you know running away from the record of the Biden administration of which I believe she's vice president of. of um, uh, taking some of Trump's lines when it comes to uh, you know, no tax on tips. Um, she's now pro border wall, which is you know very very humorous. I'm just you know, waiting on her for campaigning on locking up Hillary Clinton. Um, and and again, she can do that though because the media apparatus is so dedicated to her victory because the Democratic Party is so well organized at this point. You know when you consider that the the figures that we kind of have have, have identified as kind of the far left figures of the Democratic Party, right? Bernie Sanders, AOC, um, yeah, various aspects, though not all of the squad, were all given plat you know, major platforms during Kamala's coronation party at the DNC. You know, they, they are rank and file loyal soldiers. The few that have, you know, the, the area that has created some tension um, between the uh, kind of activist left and the Democratic Party as a whole have been over the question of Israel um, and, and foreign policy uh, connections there. We saw several members of the squad lose primaries um, where the other side was very well financed by Israeli interest groups. Um, there was tension, you know, there was a, a you know, certain aspects of you know, a handful of members of the Democratic Party that were not given speaking positions that asked for um, because of their views on the Israel question. But even though there, um, you know, the actual, you know, the, the, the extent to which there were protesters and riots in Chicago was much, much smaller than what was anticipating because, you know, a lot of these, you know, former Antifa radicals have become so lockstep with whatever the Democratic Party gives them, again, motivated by this you know, frothing hatred of Donald Trump and his supporters and everything that is they perceive as he represents, um, that you know, they've been able to, to, you know, kind of so quickly shift from you know one presidential campaign to another, again this this empty vessel of a campaign, and again this is some a this this is one aspect that you know this 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 organization this discipline um, that the left has had has been you know a, a big ass a big asset to that party, whereas the Republicans have been you know various aspects of of infighting going back really for decades now. You think back to the Tea Party, you even think of the '90s right with the the Buchanan backlash to the Bush era and things like that. So that's one aspect that the Democrats have been able to take advantage of. But again, what is the cost? Um, in terms of changes in in the actual kind of rank and file against some of these groups like Hispanic voters, like some of these other other uh, e even even junior member uh, uh, voter identification has had a major right wing shift, even if most union leadership has not. And so again, it, it's been all of these are aspects that play into this larger as this larger dynamic of political real uh, realignment that again is, is is at the very least fascinating regardless of, you know, what the, the long-term potential outcomes are from our perspective. Um, again, it's, it's definitely something worth taking note. 
Yeah, it'll be interesting to see after the election what the exit polls say and what some of this data shows in terms of any sort of realignment and if it's something that lasts uh, into the election after that, because um, these things do play out significantly over time. I don't know if it'll be enough to make a difference in this election. It'll be enough to overcome any cheating that takes place uh, in 2024. I don't know, uh, but it certainly is something that also reflects the need to do ideological work. I mean, yeah, the groups are moving around all the time. They've been doing this ever since the beginning. They did in 1800, they did it in 1860. Different political parties are have totally different ideologies over time. The modern Democratic Party doesn't look anything like the 1880 Democratic Party uh, in terms of its ideology. But it just shows how if you want to elect pro-peace people, if you want to elect laissez-faire people, you, you you have to change the ideologies of the people who are going to be voting in elections. And just shifting people around in parties, that's not going to make a difference. We're not going to see some sort of great surge in laissez-faire as a result of this election. It's going to have to come from somewhere upstream in terms of education, in terms of ideological change. And that falls on the rest of us, on those of us who aren't running in campaigns and stuff. The, the real change takes place uh, early on. It takes place bef years, decades before these elections take place because you've got to change the minds of the actual voters. And in, until you do that, the outcomes of elections aren't going to really significantly change in terms of the ideological coalitions that get formed. And and, and, and it's worth you know, thinking back to like the LNC, or the, the Libertarian Convention, right? Where that aspect, this opportunity for kind of a transitional politics um, you know, was what offered by you know, by Donald Trump himself, right? If, if the libertarians had decided that, okay, well, we can join this political coalition, we, we can get a seat at the table when it comes to a cabinet position. I know the libertarian uh, chair, uh, Angel McArdle, has tried to, to work this behind the scenes. Um, their, their nominee has no interest in it, obviously. I've been interested to see, yeah, there might be one or two of the candidates that were running there that might have been interested in that sort of line. But again, you know, think back to, again, Murray Rothbard's analysis of the old right, which is a coalition of all sorts of folks, and the, the extent to which libertarians that made up a minority in terms of the raw numbers of that coalition were able to have an outsized impact on certain views, particularly when it came to, to economics um, and foreign policy. And again, you know, when we live in a non-libertarian society, you know, when, when our ideas are minority held positions, and I, I think this is one of the aspects is that there's, there's been certain people, certain institutions in libertarian orbit that have tried to over constantly overstate how popular libertarianism really is. Like if you water it down to, you know, views on drug legalization and gay marriage, then in, in low taxes, right, you, you, you can you can perhaps, you know, rationalize, uh, oh, well, you know, we, we reflect the majority of the country, but we actually go you know, anything beyond Kind of left-wing cultural views and you know lower tax rates, then things get a little bit a lot more dicey when it comes to the proper role of state and society. We need to be very mindful of that. Um, and thankfully, again, that's that's where again I think particularly this aspect of of you know Bitcoin um, political lobbying, the aspect again aspects of the anti neocon crowd. Um, again, not that they're you know necessarily Rothbardians in foreign policy, but rejections of neocon foreign policy, and all of these are, I think, reflect very interesting advances um, for some of the issues that we believe, and again, makes this political environment, I think, yeah, again, at the very least, something worth uh, you know worth finding uh, interesting and in nothing else. All right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thanks for listening. We will be back next time with more. So we'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs>